I'm Jeff Vogel for VeroBuzzTV.com. We are on assignment. This is an actually an exciting week in Vero Beach and for all of Indian River County. We're at the main library of the Indian River County Library System right here in Vero Beach. Behind me is a singer who is, uh, who is helping to commemorate this exciting week, which is commemorating the sinking of the 1715 fleet in, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean right off the coast of of Vero Beach here, which is how the Treasure Coast got its name, the Treasure Coast. And today we're here because there's a very special speaker. It is Captain Bonnie Schubert, who is going to be speaking today to a crowd of people that is beginning to gather here in the main meeting room of the Indian River County Library. So uh, please join me as we sit back, relax, and enjoy this, this fascinating and informative informative that applause is not for me this informative talk by captain bonnie schubert about the sinking of the 1715 fleet it's the 300th commemoration event for the sinking of the 1715 fleet and really this story this story started with spain and i think that today we should give a little salute to the country of spain and to the descendants of the people that were engaged in the early exploration and discovery. For we now, really, our history has merged with them. Florida was for many years under a Spanish flag. And geographically, the Gulf Stream. I know many of you in Florida probably are boaters. You're well aware of that giant river that flows through the ocean going past our coast. It basically was a highway of gold. The treasure routes came by our coast. It was no accident. It was no accident. It was an accident of fate that the ships wrecked. But it was no accident that they were off here. That was planned. That was the way they got home. The journey started in Spain, did not start in Havana, did not start in South America and Mexico. It started in Spain when the vessels were commissioned to go to the New World and bring back these treasures. One book I'd like to recommend is Mandel Peterson, The Funnel of Gold. That's literally what it was. It was a giant funnel of gold coming from the new world back to the old world into the old world economy. That's the history. You can Google it. You can read it. You can go through the library. You can look at other books and do additional reading. What we have here on the Treasure Coast of Florida is a very unique situation. We have shipwrecks that are close to shore. Basically, they started working them back in the 50s, Kip Wagner, you've heard the stories. And now there's a small, unique group of people that continues to work on these wrecks. Probably nowhere else in the world do we have treasures of such great magnitude, so close to shore, so, well, I won't say easy for the finding, but, but really so, so readily accessible. You know, where you're going out an inlet, go out Fort Pierce, Pierce Inlet and we're we're two miles down the coast. Two miles down the coast, and uh, we're on probably one of the richest sites that you could imagine. Uh, that's the site. Not specifically identified. You have to remember that these ships out here, we've not really pinned down which vessel is which vessel of the fleet. There's good indication. The Douglas Beach site is the Nuestra Señora de las Nieves, Our Lady of the Snows. That is where that came from. But before that came up, before the gold pelican, well, before I even knew the gold pelican existed, how, how do you get to this point? How do you get to where one day you go out there and you find a gold bird? You find a piece of Spanish treasure. I guess my journey, first time I came into Fort Pierce, I was six weeks old. I was a baby in the forecastle of one of John Alden's finest schooners, the Malabar 10. I was six weeks old. My parents were on their way to New England in the charter business. Just the three of us aboard. They came into Fort Pierce because the weather was bad and they didn't want to continue offshore. Came into the inlet, anchored in the turning basin. We would have sailed right past that golden pelican that had been laying there. That was 1961. When the anchor chain went out on that schooner, since my bunk happened to be right next to the chain locker, I let out with a squall. Well, I guess that was the makings of a captain before, because I still squeal at the anchor set. That's, I'm going to run you through. I had, well, I had some slides and I had some things, but we're sort of on plan B. 
I'll maybe go through the slides later and just kind of chat to you like I do when people come up to me on the street and ask me, what do you do and how do you do it? When we found that, I'd been diving for a while. I started with Harold Holden. Harold Holden, well-known salver on this coast. He basically discovered what they call the 1810 wreck just south of the South Jetty in Fort Pierce, also known as Archie's Balance Pile. You go down to Archie's little bar and restaurant on South Beach in Fort Pierce, you walk out the front door, you walk across the beach, and you walk out in the surf, and ballast pile out there. That's where I started. We found portrait dollars, which are the Spanish milled coins. Oh, we found you know, odds and ends of artifacts and nice little iron mortar. There's uh, another one of them Harold recovered back in the 60s. It's in the St. Lucie County Historical Museum. So it's not just 1715. There's a pile of wrecks off this coast. Now that health reform is law, you cannot be denied health insurance coverage. But you can pay too much. But at ICANN, we work for you. We shop all the private and government plans available, dozens of plans, to find the plan that best suits you and your family's needs at historically low prices. As a single mom, I was convinced that we could not afford health insurance until I spoke to the people from ICANN, who told me that I qualified for a special enrollment and a subsidized rate. Now I get so much more for so much less. Call now and get the ICANN mobile app free. It takes the mystery out of comparison price shopping for prescription medicine, giving you the power to instantly find the pharmacy with the lowest price and save possibly hundreds and hundreds of dollars every single year. So don't wait another minute. Call ICANN, get covered, save money. Please call 800-345-7585. I started with Harold. Well, I guess I could say I started with Harold because um, I think Harold had a crush on my mother. <laughs> we, uh, I was divorced, living with her. We used to go to a local watering hole called the Harbor House. And holding court at the little round table in Harbor House would be John Brandon, counting his big silver piles of silver coins. He'll be here later today. And I was, you know, I was fascinated. So when my mom says, you know, down at the end of the bar, she said, there's, there's a there's a treasure hunter down there, Harold Holden. I think I met him once. So I slide off in my bar stool and I go running down there and I tap him on the shoulder and I say, you're the famous treasure hunter, Harold Holden? Harold kind of looked around. Ernie knew Harold. Harold didn't, he didn't say too much. He kind of looked at me, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I said, Harold, I said, I like to dive. I'd really like a chance to dive. Mm-hmm. And, and down there at the end of the bar is, is, is my mother and, uh, well, I think I'll just move down and buy you girls a drink. <laughs> so a few days, I kept pestering him. He still didn't want to take me diving. I don't know. I guess he thought I maybe wasn't big enough, strong enough, good enough, whatever. He didn't want to take me diving. Wait for calm weather. Wait for good weather. Wait for a good day. I'll call. I'll call. He never did call. So finally, one night, Mom called him and said, Harold, what time are you going out? You know, Bonnie's still here, and she's getting awful tired of working on her boat, and she'd like to go do some diving. He said, well, I'm leaving the dock at 6 o'clock. I think I was probably there at 5, <laughs> and uh, worked myself to death that day, trying to prove I was big enough, tall enough, strong enough, and everything else enough <coughs> to do the job. And, of course, I didn't start out with a metal detector. Those days you went out, you started out doing everything. Uh, you did whatever you could. One of my big jobs was a uh, fellow diving with us then was uh, Buddy Martin. He's found a lot of gold on this coast. And uh, one of my jobs actually was taking him his chocolate milk. When he'd sit on the transom while the hole was being blown, he'd turn around and say, hey, bring me my chocolate milk. I, know, I, was, I was pretty good at that. Um, and uh, then one day we were out and we uh, got an airlock in the engine, a little diesel engine, ran out of fuel on one tank, got an airlock. and. Harold looked at me and he said, I'm going to call Mo Molinar over. I go over, Mo's big blue Virgilona was anchored not too far from us. He said, uh, he'll, he'll tow us into the dock. We can't get this thing started. We'll have, we'll have Mo tow us in. Uh-uh. That's not me. I said, Harold, I will swim ashore before I will be towed into the dock for an airlock and a diesel engine. He looked at me and said, you do something about this? I said, I sure can. And I sure did. 
Harold offered me a two scudo to stay on for the month, the rest of the summer. If I take the boat to the fuel dock, change the oil, and just kind of oversee things and, and take care of the airlocks and the diesel engine. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and I graduated. Uh, they eventually they started out letting me use a little probe, which looks about looks about like this, and I kind of go around behind Buddy and kind of poke around under the ledges and see if I could find a coin. Found my first co found my first coin. It was a two real, and uh, then pretty soon I got the real detector. I got the big detector. I was I was one of the, I was one of the bunch and Harold would dive in the afternoon and I had the morning shift and that's how we worked. The diving, hey, that that's the good part. Uh, it's a long. There's the find. There's the hunt. That's the middle. Uh, there, there's there's two other ends to that and the first end is trying to get the right to work, whether you're working with somebody else, getting somebody to take you on as crew, take you as partner, take you on the boat, whether you're trying to rig your own boat. Hey, I've been through that. I've spent more time in the boat yards than I have in the water. And uh, trying to raise the money, trying to get the legal right to work. And that's extremely important, especially in, the, in, in, in today's. Back, back in the old days, you know, treasure hunting, there was a lot of it down in the islands. There was a lot of it in Florida that yeah, it wasn't quite finders keepers, but it, it was pretty close. And uh, it was a lot of finders, no tellers, more than so. Uh, but the environment's changed today, and we have a responsibility to report these items. But the end part, after you find something, what happens to it? What do you do with it? Conserve it, preserve it, sell it. So that, that, that's, the, that's a whole other issue. But the middle part, ah, uh, that's the good part. That's the typical day, that's the going down to the boat in the morning and decks all wet with dew and you got the whole day ahead of you. Unlimited possibilities and you get aboard, you do the routine thing, routine thing. I'm a little unusual boat we had when we found that was 30 feet. Uh, she had a big old cat 3208 diesel, uh, loud as anything, ex-commercial fishing boat and uh, mom and I ran her, ran her with my mom. Mom's been running boats all her life. Uh, she lets me be the captain now. Once, once she got into her 80s, she was 87 that summer, I guess, and when she got into her 80s, she kind of, uh, she'd listen to me once in a while, but uh, not all the time. But you go down, you check the oil. We, we never talked, you know. We, we've been working together for so long, Mom and I, that you, on boats, that you go down, you go aboard, you know, she'd start opening up the hatches, get a little air through, opening up the windows, and I'd check the oil, check the engine. And uh, when you're going out every day, you got a good routine. You just leave your lines on the pylons, and you, you back out of that slip, and, and you start out, and the sun's coming up, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I use it. Hey, today's the day. And I used it every day. I wasn't fortunate enough to dive on the Atosha the golden, with the Golden Crew. I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of them. And, and you, you say it in your heart. Day I found that. Another boat was going by us to set up and I uh, had on one of Mel Fisher's t-shirts, today's the day. And uh, they went by, I'm pointing at my shirt, you know, yelling, today's the day. Uh, yeah, 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 sure it is, you know. <laughs> but you go out, you got a position you want to work. We work off uh, survey charts, site maps, whatever you want to call it. Basically what it is is the holes that have, we call them holes where we excavate the sand uh, to get down to bedrock to search for the treasure, search for the artifacts, search for whatever we might find. Uh, the site maps have a record of the holes that have been blown and worked and what is in each one. It's color coded. So we have the scatter pattern that has been worked of the wreck site. What we don't have and what we are hoping to find is the scatter pattern that has not been worked yet. We want to extend that pattern. But we have what is known Within, you know, it's not exact. A lot of the old readings were sextant readings on beach markers, and they were, uh, you know, converted to GPS coordinates. And so there's a little bit, but basically, basically they're right. You know, the ballast pile, the, the scattered trail is pretty right. So you look at all of this and you say, okay, you know, I sort of want to, you know, maybe work in here today. I was very fortunate when I found this. It was in close collaboration. Uh, with Bill Moore, who at that time was the conservator and the t cartographer uh, for 1715 Fleet Queen's Jewels. Queen's Jewels had just taken over uh, from Mel Fisher's company, and uh, Bill was, was working with them. 
and I had gone up to him and we'd studied the charts together and basically it was it was it was Bill Moore that put me in the general area he likes to say uh, he put me in the ballpark but I hit the home run attention this important message is for any American who's about to turn 65 years of age or older Nations Helpline has Medicare supplement insurance news that may benefit you, your family, or someone you know. Most Americans who are about to turn 65 years old know they need Medicare supplement insurance, even if they already have Medicare. The Nations Helpline Medicare supplement team can guide you and help answer your Medicare questions. We can also help you find the right Medicare supplement policy from the best insurance companies around. So if you or someone you know is about to turn 65 years or older, call Nations Helpline today. Don't spend more than you have to on Medicare supplement insurance. Call Nations Helpline today and find out how easy it is to protect the ones you love. Even if you already have Medicare, this is a program for you. The call and quote is free and there are no obligations. Call today. Please call 800-632-2804. That is 800-632-2804. So it's, uh, it, but it, it's a, it's a working together. I mean, this is this is never an individual thing. Uh, you have back. You, it's not just. It's not just. It wasn't just me. I, I didn't really find that. I, I recovered it. I picked it up off the ocean floor, but there was a lot more to the find and a lot of other people in the in the background. So typical day, you go out, you drop your buoy where you want your first hole to be blown. Okay, so you swing. You run on up, you drop your bow anchor. I go up and handle the bow anchor. Mom would start backing the boat down towards the buoy. I'd run back, throw a stern anchor, and then since I'm a, I'm a little bit quicker with that single screw boat, so I'd, I'd run in the cabin, put the boat hard over, and really give it to her and back her down to drop that other stern anchor. And it's a quick, fast pace, you know, from the, from the bow to the stern and pick up the anchors. Anchors I was using that time, you know, they weighed about, no, oh, about 23 pounds, but they had about 12 feet of 3 eighths chain, so all together they probably weighed a bit over around 35 pounds, so you're in a rush, you're in a hurry, you're running back, you're grabbing you know, about 35 pounds, picking it up, and you're throwing it, and you don't want to get it tangled up when you throw it, so, uh, and you want to be right in the middle of a triangle, that's what you want. Uh, when you end up, you're going to have your, your uh, buoy for your bow anchor, you're going to have the boat, and you're going to have your two stern anchors. Well, of course, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> and I am never off the spot, and I always end up right in the center. <laughs> With the tide and the current and the wind and a little misjudging on the thing, because sometimes down there the, the tide's already turned on the surface. It hasn't turned down below, and your buoy's going one way, and the boat's going the other way. And sometimes you don't quite end up in that triangle, but you, you, you do the best you can. Uh, so you... Uh, you start gearing up, you're going to lower the blower. Uh, that's the first thing on that boat. Uh, the mailbox, I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. I can show you some pictures later, but right now I'm just going to try to explain. looks like a giant elbow macaroni. Uh, you've seen the tubes on the back of the treasure boats. You've seen them with Mel Fisher. They're giant macaroni made out of aluminum. Eh, some of them are fiberglass, but most of them, most of them are aluminum. And uh, what that does, that pivots down, and the one end of it is going to go right against your prop, right almost the edge of it will be right around that lock nut on that prop on the shaft. You pin it. Uh, different, different methods of that, generally it's a, it's a big steel pin that'll, that'll go through a, a, some sort of a, a skeg or, or some sort of a way to, to hold it in place. Once you pin that blower, you go back on deck and you're going to run that boat in gear. When you run that boat in gear, she wants to move. She can't because she's tied down. Her stern anchors are holding her. Hopefully the stern anchors are holding her. That's the plan. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> so uh, you push that throttle forward and you ease it up a little bit. You just push it forward, you're going to drag sure as anything. So you ease her up a little bit. And that prop wash okay, starts going down that tube. Just exactly like if you take a garden hose and you got that little spray nozzle on it and the way it increases the pressure, same thing. You take that spray nozzle on the end of your garden hose and you shoot it down into loose sand. That's what we do. Just on, a, just on a bigger scale. This stream of water goes down, it hits the bottom. All the loose material, whether it's sand, little rocks, or whatever, is going to be blown away. Okay? How deep you blow, how big the hole is, 
how fast this process is. It all depends, you know, the size of your prop, the RPM, depends on the bottom. It can change from, I could, I could be blowing a hole here and move over by that door, and the length of time that I would have to blow could change dramatically. Because here it might, the bottom might be like this, might be hard, hard bedrock, maybe a foot of sand over, and that water's just going to roll off that, and that stuff's all just going to roll off, and it's going to blow a giant hole quite quickly and quite efficiently. Back there, you might have some of that dense sand we get down at Douglas Beach and that trench between a couple of those reefs down there. <laughs> and you go down, there's this little shallow depression. <laughs> Did I remember to put the engine in gear? <laughs> Was I blowing all that time in neutral? <laughs> but uh, that's the setup. We blow that hole. We want to move the overburden because over the years, the items that we are looking for, the artifacts, have gone down through this sand and they have settled. So we want to move this overburden because that's, that's, all, that's all new stuff. That's all recent. There's, no, there's nothing really, there's seashells in that, there's sand in that, but we don't want sea, she, seashells. She said seashells, but it's seashells and sand. So uh, we go down into the hole. That's where our greatest tool, one of the inventions that really has brought the treasure up off this coast that Kip Wagner, you know, he had a, the, the metal detectors back there basically came from, uh, they, were, they were mine detectors. Uh, we start with, uh -huh. now how do I do this? I don't have a microphone underwater, so I don't really like these microphones. I think I am probably almost talk loud enough. Um, the, do you have a remote? Well, we, we can kind of, can everybody hear me? Yeah. You're pretty plain, yeah, okay. Uh, this is a unit. It's an aqua scan, an aqua pulse. Boy, and that's a big bright light. Um, <laughs> this is. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not promoting them or anything. I just happen to like like them because they're they are very sensitive. They're very durable, and they're also just a nice handy size, and they're good for me. The Furniture Man is a locally owned business that has served the needs of the community of Vera Beach and Indian River County for over 30 years. Here at The Furniture Man, we offer fine pieces to furnish each and every room of your home. Specializing in Floridian style, come browse our selection of bedroom, dining room, patio, and living room. Come explore over 10,000 square feet of showroom where you can find mattresses, recliners, sofas, dining, and more. Visit us at 673 US 1 in Vero Beach, Monday through Saturday, for all of your furniture needs. Stop by Patty's Printing and Graphics in downtown Vero Beach. Owner Patty Callahan prints it all, from color and black and white copies to blueprints, banners, signs, prints of paintings, and fine art. Patty makes restorations and creates outstanding graphic designs. Call Patty at 770-1521 or stop by Patty's Printing and Graphics at 2345 14th Avenue. Stop by for all of your printing needs at Patty's Printing and Graphics across from the old railroad station in downtown Vero Beach. Uh, a lot of the guys wear them on their arms. Uh, a lot of them will fasten them on their BC if they wear a BC. I don't wear a BC. I wasn't... Uh, I was never taught right. I don't have a BC, but <laughs> I hate to tell you how old I am. I was born in 1961, so when I started diving, we really didn't have BCs. <laughs> so uh, I like this. I wear mine around my waist. Nice small unit. Very simple. Not a lot of bells and whistles. Uh, mainly, you know, pretty much on and off. A little bit of sensitivity. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't have any flashing lights. It doesn't tell me. Uh, whether it's uh, aluminum or gold or, or anything else, it's just a, a good basic unit. We search the hole with this. We basically go around the bottom of the hole going like this. Because what we want, I've got a little, if I can find it here somewhere, there's a bone foam. That's a microphone. It goes under your mast strap. So we're going down around the bottom of that hole with this loop until we get that squeal. We get that squeal, means we've got a hit. We've got something. We don't know what it is, but we've got something. The rest, of, the rest of the work you do by hand. It's hand fanning. That's why they, that's it's just that's exactly what it means. You take your hand and you fan, uh, and the sand you move the sand away. So that's our tool. Uh, that's what we do. We go down. We search the hole. Sometimes we find something, sometimes we don't. 
go back over. Yeah. How big is your typical hull? That, that, as I said, that that depends on the on the bottom. Uh, the boat I had then, the, the 30 foot boat, it may be be oh, 10, 15 feet across. Uh, I've got a, a 45 foot vessel now. Uh, with twin prop wash deflectors, you get a little bigger hole. <laughs> so, and, and the depth, the depth depends on the sand. Uh, that's a good question because it, it's not a standard. Uh, what's really bad in deep sand is you start getting into just a funnel shaped hole that just goes down and you've just, you're really not clearing much bottom. You're just clearing a very small uh, circle at the base of the funnel and the rest widens out, but that's where you're, you're not going to search. Uh, but basically, then we do this over. It, it, it's just a, it's a blow the hole, search the hole, get in the boat, move the boat, repeat. And, and you just keep doing it. You know, blow the hole, you know, search the hole, get back in the boat, repeat. Naturally, if you start getting in an area where you're finding things, you slow it down. You, you start, you know, but basically you're trying to cover that ground. And one 10, 15, even 20, 30 foot hole at a time, a lot of ocean bottom out there, okay? You could be literally within he could be sitting on a pile of gold pile of gold coins he could be sitting on a pile of gold coins you like that idea <laughs> i see him you know <laughs> but uh and uh the edge of the hole that you blow could be right there i run my metal detector here it doesn't pick up those coins i get back in the boat i move the boat over here and I blow over here, and I search that hole. Nothing. I move that way. I move that way. It's the end of the day. Thunderstorms are coming. I pick up my anchors. I go home. That pile of gold coins is still there. And that's literally no exaggeration. That is how close you could come. You could literally come. You really could come within inches of, uh, of a big find and miss it. This, one of the reasons I was working in the general area other than Bill was that within the, the grid that Bill and I had kind of zeroed in on, there was uh, a gold find, well, I think it was back in the, probably back in the 1980s, sort of the heyday of, of, uh, of Douglas Beach, though I think we're coming up on a new one now, so uh, <laughs> there's, there might be some new records broken, I'm not sure, we've had some good finds this week, uh, but uh, that there was a gold find uh, inside the edge of that, that reef. Uh, that's why I was, I was working there. And this was probably uh, holes that had been logged. Uh, you know, this, this would have been the next hole over if they'd moved in that direction. But they didn't. So uh, it's, it's, a very, it, it's a very slow process. There's no guarantees. And it's really just the, the work and the perseverance that that you get to something, and luck, I have to say it. I mean, there is, there is, you, you, have to have, you have to have some luck with it because you could so easily miss that particular spot. That day, it was a Sunday, it was August 15th, 2010. Mom and I were on the boat, good, clear water. Oh, just beautiful, just a perfect set that morning. Just the kind of day you dream about. And I went down to search that hole. First hit I got was extremely loud. Um, like an aluminum can, <laughs> which we seem to find a lot of out there. Uh, not that, I mean, now you, you don't know any fishermen that drink, do you? Because somebody's out there throwing beer cans over. <laughs> and uh, at this loud hit, I start hand fanning. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I'm wearing, I wear between 16 and 18 pounds of lead weight on a good old fashioned weight belt with those big ugly squares that you know cut into your back but I like them because they're easy to take on and off and they're not like you know those little bags have you ever been on a dive boat and one of those little bags with those little BB's breaks <laughs> uh -uh. so I'm down there I'm pretty much pinned on the bottom with the weight and I'm digging and I get about up to my elbow now on that boat, I didn't have a cage on the prop. I had a little bit of a cage, enough to be legal, but not enough to keep a hose out of it. Since I was diving solo, and generally if you've got a team, if you've got a crew, uh, you put a diver in the water, and then you've got a team on the boat to move the boat, and the diver stays in the water while the hole has been blown or hangs onto a ladder on the side of the vessel. 
Uh, when you're doing on, well, I was doing both. I was moving the boat and diving. Mom was watching the, keeping an eye on things and, you know, taking care of things, but she wasn't really moving the boat. So each hole I would get out. So you figure in the water for 10 minutes, maybe, maybe 15 minutes, you're out, you're moving the boat, you're back in. I went to, I use a hook of hose uh, on the tank, leave the tank in the cockpit. So uh, with the hose, I could not run my engine at that time in gear, uh, which puts down some clear water to work under and takes away the silt that you stir up. So when I'm hand fanning, all this silt's coming up and I really, even though the water's clear around me, which is unusual too, <laughs> but I, I can't see, you know, so I'm getting this cloud, but I've got the hit and the hit's so loud by that time that Generally, you get close, you get a small hit, you turn that detector coil, the loop, the white round circle is what we call the loop or the coil. Uh, you can turn it on, your ed on the edge and you can pinpoint exactly where that little hit is. Th this was just screaming. I mean, you know, this, this was so big that it was just, you know, anywhere the detector loop was near, it's just screaming. So in that case, you just kind of try to get it out of your way and you, turn, you can almost basically turn your detector off because you know, you, you know that something is big enough where you're hand fanning that, you know, you're going to find it. You don't need the, the sound anymore. So I'm about ready to leave it because sometimes, you know, a big, big hit, you know, I'll check the rest of the hole, come back and dig a little more. I'm getting a little tired. I turned away just for a minute and it started to clear and I turned back. It, it was laying there. The, the uh, bird, as you see, it was just, just like that. It, it was upright and that's the way I saw it. It's missing a wing, but the good side was up with the wing and the head and it was upright. The first thing that appeared was the head and the sands kind of sifting off of it and kind of clearing. Underwater everything looks huge because your mask magnifies things so you're, and I'm only about this far from it, you know, I'm, I'm laying, because I'm laying on the bottom, I've been digging, I'm laying, I'm looking at it, and it's looking at me. <laughs> and uh, no, I didn't spit out my regulator and I didn't squeal and I just got real quiet. I, I just. I think, which, you know, is a big no-no when you're scuba diving, but I think I just held my breath. I, 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 just, I don't think I breathe. I, I was just, just laying there looking at it. Now that health reform is law, you cannot be denied health insurance coverage. But you can pay too much. But at ICANN, we work for you. We shop all the private and government plans available, dozens of plans, to find the plan that best suits you and your family's needs at historically low prices. As a single mom, I was convinced that we could not afford health insurance until I spoke to the people from ICANN, who told me that I qualified for a special enrollment and a subsidized rate. Now I get so much more for so much less. Call now and get the ICANN mobile app free. It takes the mystery out of comparison price shopping for prescription medicine, giving you the power to instantly find the pharmacy with the lowest price and save possibly hundreds and hundreds of dollars every single year. So don't wait another minute. Call ICANN, get covered, save money. Please call 800-345-7585. Uh, the, the general depth there was, uh, it was about 17 feet, uh, but we had about eight feet, of, eight feet of sand in the area, so to the bottom of the hole was a little deeper. And uh, I look at it, and I look around the hole, I know there's nobody in the water, but I felt like, anybody see this? Does anybody see this? Does it, yeah, that, it's a, uh, you know, <laughs> it's here. So I pick it up very gently, very carefully and uh, started back up to the surface. My mother was on the boat. She was looking over the transom, in the stern of the boat, the back of the boat, and uh, she said the water was so clear she could see the gold shining from the time I left the bottom. She didn't know what it was. She couldn't see the shape, but she could see, she knew I had something that was gold, pretty good size. The size of my hand, it's five and a half inches tall, 177 grams, which is about seven ounces, Pure 22 karat gold. Climbed up the ladder on the transom, reached over, had it in my hand. I said, uh, looked at my mom and I said, uh, like all good treasure hunters, uh, you really think it's real? <laughs> because I knew it was real. I knew it was probably the most fantastic find I would ever have, but 
the comprehension to really actually believe that you had just uncovered this, that you had just moved the sand and it, and it was, was laying out there. I mean, there were, there were boats diving for lobster all around us. I mean, there were people on the beach running up and down the beach and uh, getting suntans and looking for seashells and all of the normal activity of US-1 and, and Fort Pierce was, was going on and people were going to work and yet you had been out there and you were down under the water, you know, maybe 500 feet from shore and you dug a hole in the sand and you reach your hand in and you pull that out and it just really almost is too much to comprehend. That is, that, that's the beauty of it. It is too much to comprehend. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news this week, there's been a big gold fine, uh, very, just a little bit north of the area that, that we were working there, and they, that's too much to comprehend. These gold coins are there. Uh, when, before I came to Fort Pierce, my mother was sending me uh, newspaper clippings. You know, one year there was 16, 18 pounds of gold came from Douglas Beach. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's out there. And, uh, not only can we try to comprehend it, and we can try to study where it came from, we actually, off here, have an opportunity to go out there and do this. Uh, these wrecks have been worked since the Mel Fisher days. They've been worked under sort of a subcontractor system, uh, in which if, if you have a boat and you get a contract from the person that is legally in charge of the sites, uh, you can go out there, you put up your boat, your time, your diesel fuel, your effort, and in return for that, you receive a share of what you find. Uh, where, 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 else, where else can you do that? Uh, the state of Florida, they also receive a share of it. Uh, these leases off here, I, I won't touch too much on the, um, on the legalities of it. Uh, it's a very, very complicated topic. It is also something I want to touch briefly on, though, because it is very pertinent. It is something that there also needs to be awareness of it, because we are in a, we're in a time of change right now uh, all over the world. Um, the way that historic shipwrecks, which these certainly qualify as historic shipwrecks, are being worked is, uh, is changing. We have countries that are now trying to develop and implement a plan on how their underwater cultural heritage will be managed. Countries such as the Bahamas, which are very close to our coastline, contain a lot of wrecks. Countries such as Cuba will soon be addressing this problem. Uh, all through the Caribbean, uh, Spain, a lot of you have seen the news and, and um, seen maybe saw about Odyssey. Uh, Spain has been, you know, are they, are they Spanish wrecks or do they belong to the Spanish crown still? Do they belong? Okay, thank you. Um, who, who do they belong to? Who, who has jurisdiction? Who has the rights to them? Well, you know, that's a topic for lawyers and a topic for courts and uh, the, the wrangling will never stop because when you have but it's a two-way thing, and what you need to remember is that these shipwrecks yield valuable items. This is a gold eight Escudo from the same wreck. Uh, I didn't find it. It was found by Mo Molinar in 1988. This is tangible. It's easy to hold. It's easy to sell. It's great to wear around your neck, but you know, there are other items, maybe such as that, some of the pieces that have been found that, that where do they end up? So there has to be some regulation. There has to be a working together. And it's, it's sad when sometimes the system and the model breaks down. So uh, that's just a little something to keep in mind when you read some of the news reports. These sites off here. Yeah, yeah my, uh, I'm sure that you feel a connection with the folks that the Spaniards have lost their lives. Mm -hmm. Pick up something like this. It's just you know you're the first person that's touched that you know since they lost that in the shipwreck. And exactly. I know exactly. A lot of the salvers you know feel that connection with those folks. You you do you feel a connection. A lot of people will say, well, oh, you know, Spain was a terrible, cruel country. They were over there taking these things from the Indians. They were taking these things. They were stealing them. They were taking them back. But we have to keep in perspective. It was a different time. 
uh, it was a it, it was an age of when empires were expanding, and the New World was a terrific opportunity. Uh, it was every nation in Europe wanted a piece of the New World, and uh, their methods we may question now, but I don't think there's any country in the world, including the United States, does not have a little bit in their background and in their history that perhaps now today we question. So. That is, well, that's history. That's why we study and we try not to make the same mistakes. Back to the pelican, pelican of piety. Dr. Eugene Lyon, uh, who really was responsible for locating the Atosha for Mel Fisher, he, he called with the, with the One dollar is all it takes to start up to $100,000 of life insurance protection. That's right, $1 can provide up to $100,000 of much needed financial support for your remaining loved ones. Since 1951, Globe Life and Accident Insurance Company has been providing families with life insurance protection. $1 covers the first month of coverage whether you choose from $5,000 up to $100,000 of coverage. Globe Life coverage offers these benefits. First day coverage means no waiting periods. Easy to buy, no medical exam, no risk 30 day money back guarantee. Up to $150,000 of accidental death coverage can be added to your policy. Globe Life makes buying life insurance easy. Maybe that's why millions of people have Globe Life coverage. Call the number on the screen now for complete information by return mail or to speak with one of our licensed representatives. Uh, identification. It's a pelican? No, it's an eagle. It's a falcon. It's a bird of prey. Look at that beak. It's not a pelican. No. You Google pelican of piety. It's, uh, it's an iconic Catholic image, uh, very prevalent in heraldry, uh, very prevalent in the Catholic Church as far back as the 13, 1400s. It's been on the standards of popes. It's on the state seal of Louisiana, the state flag. Sometimes it's depicted at the base of this one, there's a fleur-de-lis. Uh, the fleur-de-lis, you know, it could rep represent uh, the Bourbon dynasty, Philip V. It could represent the French connection. It could also represent the Holy Trinity. Uh, that we don't really know. But the pelican of piety, the pelican is vulning. She is wounding. Her beak is touching her breast. She is drawing blood. That blood in the depictions is used to feed the baby pelicans in times of famine. Often it's, it's shown, technically, the pelican in her piety would have the baby chicks around her in a nest. It's often shown like that. This one is just vulning. The, the beak in, in um, terms of heraldry is embowed. The neck is embowed. And powerful, powerful image. It represent, represents the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, sometimes you will see these with a ruby. A uh, ruby set in the breast, Renaissance jewelry, it was a popular theme, very famous portrait of uh, Elizabeth I of, of England. Uh, it's the, the pelican uh, sundial, Oxford Cambridge University in the UK. Uh, it's just a very, very moving image. It also represents maternal sacrifice. Um, I kind of like that one, saying that I think my mother gave up quite a lot to be out there on that smelly little diesel boat in the middle of, mid, middle of the summer to assist me. So what it is, what the object actually was designed for, we really, we've done research. Uh, we might not ever know for sure. Uh, there was a place for a chain, a loop, loop for a chain on the top of the wing. The other wing is missing, a loop for a chain on top of the back of the neck, uh, probably hung with three chains. Uh, Priscilla Mueller, who was a curator for many years of the Hispanic Society Museum in New York, a very well-known researcher, uh, she, I wrote to her, sent her pictures, and she felt that the center would have held a crystal, which would have been basically a glass vial, a crystal vial to hold a relic. In that case, it would have been a reliquary. Uh, the, it back in, back in that age and time, uh, pieces of a saint's body were, were very revered, whether it was a piece of, cloth, piece of cloth, piece of bone, any piece that they thought was consecrated. 
Uh, when the saint died, it was believed that the Holy Spirit came into the body, so anything that had been touching that was in itself consecrated and was holy, and it would go inside a reliquary for personal devotion. That, the research that I've done, my limited knowledge of uh, Catholicism and uh, religious artifacts, uh, that to me seems to be the most, the most fitting and, and appropriate identification of the object. Uh, it, it, and it could have been, maybe it was decorative. When I first found it, I thought, well, well Ernie put in his Plus Ultra magazine, my first quote at the time was, I'm going back out to look, to look for the missing wing and the giant ruby that was inside the middle. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, we all, have our, we all have our own interpretations. It's, uh, but whatever, whatever it was meant for, Whoever it was meant for, that, that's the other thing. Was it a, a passenger's uh, personal item? Uh, was it going back to the church? Was it a, in a box of basically trade goods? Uh, we had a, at the symposium the other day, there was a, a fellow there that a very, uh, has done extensive research in the archives, Jorge Proctor, and we were talking about it, and he said, you know, a lot of the religious items were, um, when you find several together, they were stored in a box, and basically they were trade goods because many of them had been melted down. I just learned this the other day. They had been melted down during the period of the War of the Spanish Succession, which was prior to 1715. That's why these ships were so lo loaded. A lot of other people have probably mentioned this, but uh, this fleet was so important because that war had just ended and it had held up the normal trade routes for many years, and the king was desperately in need of the cargoes that these vessels were carrying. So, you know, you, uh, I kind of, uh, to me, I consider it a religious artifact. I uh, trade goods. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> I kind, of, I kind of picture the little glass beads that maybe went that way, <laughs> not back to Spain, but you know, went the, went the other way. But with that. I guess, uh, you know, I try to keep this, this really isn't about me, but uh, on the other hand, I have a very, very personal connection to the work that I do, and it has brought home to me that we have all, we have all these journeys, okay? We have the age of exploration and discovery. We have the, the journey of the, the ships to South America. We have the journey of the ships back. We have all the stories, all the, the people that look for shipwrecks, the treasure hunters, the Mel Fishers, the Robert Marxes, the Kip Wagners, the, the people that, that, that do this. But when you start on something like this, it can be your own little personal journey. And in doing that, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about your beliefs, and that changes every day. Uh, my concept of a lot of the, a lot of the laws and a lot of the rights and wrongs are, are changing continually, and you know that's a good thing, because history, history's today. I mean, you know, today is, is as they say, tomorrow's history. So we are when we go back and study these things, what we find out on a small scale about each. One of us. I mean, you read a book about this, you start thinking about this. You maybe go to the beach and you pick up a coin. You might not think anything more about it. You might mm, pick it up, take it home, have it mounted, wear it around your neck. You might be walking down the street somewhere. Maybe you're in Kansas City. Somebody comes up and says, what's that around your neck? That's an interesting medallion. Who made that? And you say, oh, well, yeah. It's, it's a it's a it's a nice medallion. Uh, now now if you're if you're <laughs> and I'm going to say this is a Lima Lima Ada Scudo. <laughs>
As a single mom, I was convinced that we could not afford health insurance until I spoke to the people from ICANN, who told me that I qualified for a special enrollment and a subsidized rate. Now I get so much more for so much less. Call now and get the ICANN mobile app free. It takes the mystery out of comparison price shopping for prescription medicine, giving you the power to instantly find the pharmacy with the lowest price and save possibly hundreds and hundreds of dollars every single year. So don't wait another minute. Call ICANN, get covered, save money. Please call 800-345-7585. <laughs> but you might just say, this is a treasure coin. This is a shipwreck treasure coin. And I say, shipwreck, where? Florida. And then the story grows. And then maybe that person becomes fascinated with the story. They tell somebody else. They buy a coin. They go to Florida. They research the history. And you never know where each one of these little and very, very individual personal journeys is going to end or what you're going to learn. So that's, that's, basically, that's basically my story. I'm going to see if I can maybe pull up a few slides, slides for you there. My, uh, my, my, Mac, my elbow didn't connect to my hip bone. My Mac didn't connect to my <laughs> projector. But uh, I think I maybe can run through a few slides that will give you a little bit of an indication. Uh, I can go kind of the old-fashioned route here. and. Kind of, kind of like my navigation. First, yeah. First, why don't we do that? I see a hand back there, so why don't we take a few questions? That pelican? Well, I would like to say it's uh, in my china cabinet, but <laughs> no, it was sold to a private collector. Uh, as I said, I work as a subcontractor, and uh, when you find an item like that, uh, we we split the the proceeds of it 50-50. And since you can't chop it in half, uh, you, you sell it. And actually, it's in uh, one of the larger private collections of 1715 fleet material. I feel very satisfied with that. It is not on view. That's, well, that's the flip side of it. We, we do wish these items could be displayed. We wish the more unique and rare items would go to museums. But th that's a more difficult process than a lot of people realize. Uh, a lot of people are, a lot of museums are not set up for displays. Yes? So the government, um, Florida gets 20%, so did you give them money instead of part of your time? Well, it, it's sort of a, it's a simplification to say Florida gets 20%. Uh, they have a, they have a right, uh, they have a settlement agreement right uh, to, a, to request up to a 20% share uh, from the shipwreck sites. What this is designed to do is to give them a, an opportunity to obtain items uh, that are rare and unique and are not already in the state collection. The state maintains a massive collection uh, in Tallahassee. It is available for research. Uh, it is available for loan. There are many items. I believe the conservator told me recently that they have about 130 items out on loan all over the world at this time to be studied. So the site that this was found on in that particular year, 2010, this was probably 99.9% .9 of the find on that site. Uh, I was about the only one working the site. Uh, other than that, the only thing I really found was uh, a couple of very, very small, unimportant silver coins and some you know, odds and ends of things. So the state did not request anything from that site because they, they could not receive more than the 20%. So they would have had to make up the difference. They would have had to make up the 80%, which generally um, their, their general sentiment is against barter in items such as this. So they feel that to try to purchase these items for uh, the people's collection would not be appropriate. Uh, so th that's, yes. Yeah. And how, what, what do you do if uh, you, you find something, what's your, what's your paperwork trail or your procedure? Okay, well, uh, as far as myself, as I said, it was rather simple because I am working, or I was working, I am not this year, I'm no longer a sub, uh, subcontractor for 1715 Fleet Queen's Jewels. Uh, I was working under a subcontract. They were holding 
the permits and the paperwork. Actually, the paperwork is quite extensive. Uh, we work under an Army Corps of Engineers permit, a uh, DEP permit. Uh, basically, we're, we're dredging out there. We are, we are moving sand. And uh, so we are working under those permits. Uh, these, these, the 1715 sites that are being worked now uh, are under a federal admiralty claim, what you call an admiralty claim, an admiralty arrest. Uh, that is the very, very old maritime tradition, law of the sea, however you'd like to explain it, was set up way, way back, cent centuries ago, when uh, most of the commerce of the world uh, was, was by ship. And they wanted to encourage, if a ship went down, a ship was in peril, they wanted to encourage people to step in that weren't involved with that ship to salvage and save it. Well, <laughs> reward. Reward for risk. The risk involved in salvaging, the risk involved in stepping in, putting maybe your vessel, your life in danger to save another one, other than just doing it for a moral or ethical reason, uh, there was a reward involved. Uh, that, has, that has come down really, really to, to these to, to modern times. Uh, it works the same for modern vessels. If my Hatteras sinks over in the Bahamas or goes up on a reef, I have a very good friend over there in the salvage business, salvages a lot of yachts, a lot of cruise ships, and uh, he would have a right to attempt to salvage my vessel. He would have to contact me because the owner is known, but he would receive a reward for his salvage efforts. These vessels are considered abandoned, abandoned and unidentified. Uh, even though they have been identified as a 1715 fleet, the salver, in return for his work, receives an award, which is granted by the Federal District Court, the Southern District Court, and basically the reward is in specie. It is in like kind. It is in treasure. So the treasure that is being recovered now, say this summer, it will go before the Federal Court, and if it, if it all goes well and, and the judge rules that yes, you have worked these rec, you have put your, your, you deserve this, then it is returned as a reward. What complicates things is that these vessels basically, they're right on the shore of Florida. Uh, that's where you get into the jurisdiction because the state of Florida uh, has a territorial limit uh, for sovereign submerged land of three miles. These wrecks are within the three mile limit. Uh, that, that's one thing people ask a lot is how much is it, how much was it worth? Uh, it was appraised at 885,000. Uh, that was an appraisal. But I like to say, you know, what is it worth? Was it worth, was it worth the thousand people that died in the sinking of the 1715 fleet? Was it worth all the, all the, all the disasters, all the shipwreck disasters, the war of Spanish succession when they wanted more money, was it worth the, the Indians? Was it worth the slavery? Was it worth the people that went before me? Uh, like Mel Fisher losing his, uh, losing his son and his daughter-in-law, was it worth that? Was it worth all my bottom paint, all my aluminum, all my <laughs> days in the boatyard? To me, to me it was worth it, personally it was worth it, but it is very, very hard to put a dollar vi value on, on these items because there is so much in them. There is so, it is beyond, uh, you can go, a lot of you maybe go down, they have that big uh, art and antique fair in, in Palm Beach each year and they have beautiful items from Europe, uh, many items of the same era. And, uh, but those don't have the same story in them. Those don't have, uh, they don't have, the story of these shipwrecks is in these items now. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Hi, I'm Penny Chandler. I'm, I'm Freddie Woolfolk. I am Barbara Hoffman. And I'm Gregory Simpson. I'm here with Police Chief David Curry. You're in good company on VeroBuzzTV.com, Vero Beach's local TV station on the internet. I just love it. Tell a friend. Hey!